Day three. Arriving at a campground after dark is never desirable, but at least we didn't need to cook when we pulled into Longleaf Camp after 9 p.m. All of the campsites at Congaree National Park are walk-in only, and I've chosen number three based on its proximity to the parking lot. Our site was about 70 yards from the lot and pit toilets, which wasn't so bad. The slippery spot was the dark, muddy path that connected the two. Not much had been packed properly into the truck after leaving Shenandoah with wet gear, so at least five trips were needed to deliver the basics to the site. It has been raining for weeks in this part of the country, and this floodplain was living up to its name. It is customary to keep our voices low when setting up camp after dark, but there was only one other family staying at the 10 site place, and whispers could not be heard over the orchestra performing in the swampland beside us. My notes said to be wary of spiders, snakes, and mosquitoes, but none of those played the instruments that were ear piercing. The cacophonous racket added to the discord associated with setting up wet gear, 70 yards from the vehicle that we just spent 450 miles together in. It was at this time that the most important bag to locate was the one containing the insect repellents. Our arsenal ranged from Repel Lemon Eucalyptus to Natrell with Picaridin to Deep Woods Off with Heavy Deep 100 to Blue Listerine. We were also armed with four afterbite pens, a bottle of calamine, and a jug of aloe vera as we settled into the concert of frogs, crickets, and cicadas at the loudest campground ever. There was a slew of swatting, a scattering of scratching, and a bit of cussing that lasted from sundown through morning as we begged the sunshine to shed some light on our wet gear. Our tent was shaded by the thickness of the hardwoods around us, but the heat of summer had started the steamer. Damp bedding in a tent creates a sauna situation, which prompted us to get an early start to exploring Congaree National Park. We stopped at the Harry Hampton Visitor Center, which is also the trailhead for the Boardwalk Loop Trail. Inside the center, between the restrooms, is the ever-important Skeeter Meter. This dial is adjusted by park rangers depending on the active population of the biting terrorists. Luckily for us, the reading on this morning was only a 2.5, which placed us between mild and moderate. My breath and every inch of my body already smelled like blue Listerine, so I felt undesirable to the bloodsuckers. This protected hardwood forest is the largest remaining in a floodplain in all of North America. These wetlands, oxbow lakes, creeks, and sloughs are only 1% of this 35 million acre parcel lost to logging and development. These southern floodplains were drained for pastures, farms, and cities, while loggers had already begun decimating the deciduous, especially the bald cypress trees. We headed out on the 2.4 mile boardwalk loop trail, which is a well-constructed, safe, handicap accessible vantage place to view the wetlands and Weston Lake. The boardwalk traverses through North America's largest old growth bottomland hardwood forest. Visitors walk among the beech, oak, maple, loblolly pines, holly, tupelo, and bald cypress trees that abound. My attention was immediately drawn to the dark reddish brown hue of the motionless water that appears to be flooding the forest floor. My thoughts went to Augustus Galoop, and I started to crave chocolate milk as I leaned over the railing to capture the color of the swampy Darwin muck. This thick mixture of clay and old leaves helps to keep the floodplain healthy by filtering water, trapping pollutants, and turning them into harmless compounds. And it definitely resembled a Chaka River. I certainly haven't ever witnessed a biosphere such as this one, and now I understand its UNESCO accreditation as a, such a reserve. There is a need to protect and understand places with exceptional biodiversity of natural resources and cultural heritage, and Congaree is one. The boardwalk trail meanders over Cedar Creek and highlights the majestic beauty surrounded by the bent knees of the bald cypress trees. Although many conifers are evergreens, these unique Beauties are deciduous conifers dropping their needle-like leaves so early in the season that they appear to be balding. 
Curiosity abounds with cypress knees that crop up throughout the murky muck to either provide air to the drowned roots or possibly to support the tall timbers during storms. These resilient statues can live to be a thousand years old, impervious to rot and water damage. Water tupelos and South Carolina's state cabbage palmetto dominate the landscape on much of this hike. The tupelos are easily identified by their swollen trunks and are found in the deeper water, while the palmettos thrive best in the sandy areas where sunlight has the ability to reach the forest floor. The loblolly pines are also a unique species that can tolerate wet conditions better than most pines. Loblollies are the tallest trees in South Carolina because of their ability to weather forest fires, droughts, and heavy rains. There's something I like about saying loblollies. Try it. Loblollies, loblollies, loblollies. We took a break at Weston Lake, once a bend on the Congaree River, and now oxbowed into a freshwater pool for various critters. Looking across the lake, we caught a glimpse of our first alligator. There was no mistaking that crusty crown and beady-eyed stare as he cruised slowly along the shoreline looking right at us. The distance was great, but we were still able to point him out to the children marking off spots on their wildlife bingo cards. While resting and taking in what this swampy setting offered, a lovely butterfly came to perch upon my cap. She was quite possibly a gossamer-winged butterfly, perhaps like a nadia, but regardless of her name, she was beautiful. We chatted with a family from Texas whose children were more amused by the butterfly on my head than the two turtles fighting for tourist time at the base of the pier. With no exaggeration, this butterfly stayed on my hat for over 15 minutes, long after we left our resting positions by the lake and continued hiking. There's a covered picnic area near the visitor center where we enjoyed our lunch and contemplated hatching a new plan for the afternoon and evening. We were slated to spend the rest of the day at Congaree and leave early in the morning, driving 500 miles with minimal stops en route to Cape Canaveral. Our gear had finally dried, but more rain was coming. We were the only campers left at the Longleaf, and there wasn't anything keeping us there for another night. We opted to pack up camp, haul our gear down the muddy path, and figure out a place to stay further down south. The campsite loss was $10.00 and I was sure that we could find something near the coast for a reasonable fee. Next stop, the smallest church in America in Shinetown, South Carolina.